This week, we are going to be celebrating and commemorating the holiday of Lag Baomer. It's an interesting holiday with an interesting backstory with all kinds of interesting customs. For example, in Israel, it's the date of the largest pilgrimage in the land. Roughly somewhere between 500,000 and a million people travel to the northern city of Meiron, a small mountain in which the great Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried. It's a day that we get haircuts. It's a day that we do bonfires. Some people have a tradition to shoot bows and arrows on this day. It's a very unusual day. It doesn't appear in the Torah. And it has really, um, I think, really interesting and, and valuable origins. So what I want to do now is kind of study the backstory of the Omer in general and specifically Lagba Omer. So what's the background of this, of this day? So first of all, Lag is not an actual word. It is a date. In Hebrew, every letter has a corresponding number. So Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and it's the number one and then two and then three and then four and then 10 and 20 and 30, 40. Eventually you get 100 and 200, 300 and 400. The 22 Letters of the Hebrew alphabet correspond to 22 different numbers, going from 1 to 10, 10 to 100, and then 100 to 400. Thus, the th- the number 33 corresponds to the word lag, because the lamed is 30, and the gimel is 3. So when we say lag by omer, it's the 33rd day of the omer. Now, what's the omer, you may ask? Well, last week in the prior show, we read about the omer. Last week, we read about all the festivals, and it talks about Pesach, and it talks about Shavuot, the two festivals, and in between those two, there's a bridge, and that's the counting of the Omer. Starting from day two of Pesach, we bring a special offering, a barley offering in the temple called the Omer offering, and that kickstarts a counting of 49 days that culminates on the 50th day, which is Shavuos, on which we bring a second offering, not a barley offering, not the Omer offering, but a different offering, a wheat offering, which is called the Shte Halechem. Thus, the Torah tells us that there is a certain bridge, so to speak, connecting Pesach and Shavuot, connecting those two festivals, that is called the Omer period, in which we count the Omer. In fact, it's a myth in the Torah. One of the 630 mitzvahs is to count the 49 days, 7 days, and 7 weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. The Ramban, Nachmanides, he compares it to, to the concept of Chol Hamoe, just like we have in Pesach. You know, Pesach is a 7-day festival. First day, last day, and then you have the 5 interim days. Those interim days, it's still Pesach. You still can't eat chametz, you still have to eat matzah. But it's not a festival in which you cannot do work. You could do work. It's just kind of an intermediate day. Similarly, on a conceptual level, says the Ramban, you have Pesach, which is like one half of a grander festival. Shavuot, which is the end of that grand festival. And then you have the days in between, the days of the Omer. And that is the intermediate days that are connecting these two. And specifically, it's linked to those Offerings, you have the barley offering on the second day of Pesach and the wheat offering on Shavuot. And we count those days in, in between. Now, there is a debate amongst the commentaries if the counting of the Omer today, i.e. when the temple is not extant, i.e. when those offerings, the Korban Omer, the Omer offering of the second day of Pesach and the Shteh the the wheat offering of Pesach, when those are not offered, is there still a mitzvah to bridge those two with the Kanti of the Omer? Everyone agrees there is a mitzvah. Is it rabbinic? Is it Torahitic? That is a debate. Now, what's the rationale for this mitzvah? What's the underlying message of this mitzvah? Because these days are special days. It's, it's the Omer. It's between these two festivals. And there's obviously a reason for this mitzvah that we're counting. It's a very unusual mitzvah to count the days. What's the meaning behind it? So maybe there's uh, several answers. But one of the answers is brought down in the book of the Chinuch, the Sefer Chinuch, which is a medieval book which delineates the mitzvahs of the Torah and gives a reason behind each mitzvah. 
And he says, very powerful insight, the reason why our nation exists, what is the raison d'etre, as they say in French, of our nation? Why are we here? Why is there such a thing called the Jewish nation? Question number one. Question number two, the reason why the world exists, why did Almighty create the world? Number three, why did the Almighty do the Exodus? The answer to all those three questions is one word, Torah. Our nation, our heritage, our existence is Torah. He quotes a verse. The verse tells us that the reason why the Almighty created the world, Torah. The reason why the Almighty did the Exodus, it wasn't just to save us from our plight of being an enslaved people. It was to bring us to Mount Sinai and to give us the Torah. And therefore, what happens? You have the Exodus. Delightful. You're free men. But you know that this is just the first step of the journey. Because now you're spending 50 days to get to Sinai to complete the liberation at the foot of the mountain when you're going to get the Torah. So the Jewish people, they leave Egypt, the Exodus, it's on Pesach. And they start counting because they know soon, within 50 days, we're going to be at Mount Sinai and the culmination, the summation of this exodus is going to be when we get the Torah. And therefore, just as someone who has deep anticipation for something, they count down the days, they're waiting, they're focused entirely on what they're looking forward to. That's why we have the mitzvah to count the days. Now, the the Chinuch asks an interesting question. He says, I don't get it. Jewish people know that they're going to get the Torah 50 days after the Exodus, and therefore they're counting. Doesn't it make sense to count down? You start with 50, and then you go to 49, then 48, 46. How many days you have left? Why are you counting up? Why is the second day of Pesach, day one, day two, day three? And of course, the 33rd day of the Omer is day 33, etc. So we, so why don't we count down instead of counting up. So he gives an answer. He says, listen, it's kind of depressing to think about how many days you have left. It's it's the third day of the Omer, but instead you say it's 47 days left. It could be it could be depressing. It could be overwhelming. The Jewish people were so anticipating Sinai that it was more productive for them to think, oh, we already accomplished two days. Oh, we, you know, we've we've killed two days, we've killed three days, we 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 we've moved, we've progressed towards towards Sinai and focus on that. And that's a way for them to keep their eye on the ball without getting dejected how many more days we have left. Another answer is offered by the sages. You know, we have this connection between between Exodus, between Pesach, and between Sinai, between getting the Torah. And we have this other connection between the the Omer offering, the barley offering, and the Shteelechem offering, the weed offering. And our sages tell us in the Talmud that barley is synonymous with animal food. And wheat is synonymous with human food. And we know, our sages tell us, the Ramban, for example, tells us, that a human is a hybrid of an animal. We have an animalistic body and an angel. And what makes us human is not our body, it's our soul. And therefore, we're being upgraded from the beginning, so to speak, where there's the physical liberation and therefore there's the food which nourishes our physical animalistic side. That's the exodus. And the completion of that is where we get to exhibit our humanity by focusing, so to speak, on the angelic side, i.e. becoming human because that is done via via the Torah. On, on the day of Shavuot, the day we get the Torah, that's the day in which we really achieve our our humanity. And thus, the theme of these weeks is all about preparing for Sinai, preparing for the Torah. In fact, we have a tradition to study Perkei Avos, to study the chapters of the Fathers, because that's really what gets us in the zone for, for Torah. Now, there's an interesting question, and that is, why do we start the counting from the second day of Pesach? Shouldn't it be more natural? First day of Pesach is the first day of the Omer. Why is the first day of Pesach not counted at all? The second day of Pesach, that's the first day of the Omer, and you count from there. Isn't that more logical? So he gives an answer, the Sefer Chinuch does. He says, listen, the first day of the Pesach was a day of the tremendous miracle. You don't want to muddle that day 
with anything else. That's a day that's designated. It's only about the Exodus. You don't think about, about Sinai. You don't think of anything else. That's a day that's focused, laser focused on the Exodus. Once you're done that, then you could kind of move on to the next project, i.e. start your trek to Sinai. My grandfather, blessed memory, used to always say a very deep insight. What happened on the night of the Exodus? On the night of the Exodus, there was a revelation that elevated the nation, a nation of slaves, a nation of idolaters, into the highest peak, the acme of the human experience. It was totally unnatural. It was totally artificial. God, so to speak, temporarily elevated us, and we had the Exodus. What happened the next day? The next day, God said, okay, you've seen the promised land. You've had that experience. Now it's time to go back to the bottom rung and start from scratch. And our sages tell us that there's really 50 levels of greatness that we should achieve. On the first night of Pesach, we were temporarily catapulted to level 50. The next day, it's natural now. We're brought down to the first rung. And now it's time to start making your way there yourself. The Sinai experience and the Exodus experience were the identical experience. Highest level, level 50. The difference is, is that at the Exodus, they achieved it artificially. God says, okay, I'm, I'm pulling you out even though you're not worthy of it. And then over the course of the next 50 days, each day, they unlocked another level and they moved up one Rung until finally at Sinai, they actually got there themselves and therefore they had the same experience, but this time they earned it. It's almost, there's a analogy. Uh, a, a businessman had a, a huge building, 50 stories, and the whole operations of all his business activities were done in this building. And he was going to pass it on to his son. So he takes his son and brings him up to the 50th floor and shows him the, the suite and you know the all the management's all there on the top. And he's there. You get to taste it. Okay, now time to really understand the business. Go down to the first floor, understand the first floor, move up to the next floor, and eventually really earn it. Yes, you get to taste it a little bit at the beginning. Now it's time to earn it. So that's really the connection again between Pesach and, Shav- and Shavuot. It's the same level, it's the same stature, it's the same level 50, but the Omer is the bridge because now you you taste it, now it's time to actually live it, to become it via these 50 days. So that's one concept of these days, the days of the Omer. Our sages tell us that there's also a kind of a sad component to this day, and that is that the students of Rabbi Tiva, they passed away, many of them passed away during these Days during the days between Pesach and, and Shavuot. The Talmud of the book of Yavam is page 62b tells us, it starts with a teaching from Rabbi Kiva. If you teach Torah in your youth, teach Torah in your old age. If you have students in your youth, have students in your old age. Why? Because you never know which ones are going to succeed. And then he gives us the context. It says Rabbi Kiva had 24,000 students, 12,000 pairs of chavrusas, of, of study partners, and they all died in one time period, in one time frame, because they did not accord each other sufficient honor. And after they died, the world was bereft of Torah. Until Rabbi Kiva, he came to the sages in the south, and he had five students in the south. And who are these five students? They are none other than great Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. And the Talmud goes on to elaborate this devastation of the death of 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, when did that happen? That happened between Pesach and between Shavuos. And why did it happen? The Talmud tells us they did not accord each other sufficient respect. Why specifically did they die in this period? Because after all, the period between Pesach and Shavuot is the time to prepare for Torah. If you don't respect your study partner, If you don't accord the fellow Torah scholar their due honor, their due respect, well, then this is the day that you're the most vulnerable because this is the time you have to focus more than anything else on Torah and preparing yourself for the day. If you're not honoring the Torah scholar, you're obviously not preparing and therefore you are vulnerable. So this is kind of the background 
to Lag Omer, to the 33rd day of the Omer. So on one hand, the period of the Omer is a period of mourning. Our sages tell us that the custom is not to shave, not to get haircuts, not to have weddings, not to listen to music up to Lag Omer. Once Lag Omer comes, then everything is allowed. Some people wait till the 34th day, but that's the time period where everything changes. So it's mourning, and then it's kind of like a celebration. And it seems to be, you know, somewhat diametrically opposite. On one hand, you have the mourning, all these great sages died. On the other hand, you have this happiness. It's Lag Omer. It's a festival. It's a holiday. We, we, we listen to music. We get haircuts. It's a time of celebration. What's the, kind of the interplay between, between these, these two experiences? And the answer is that yes, on one hand, it's a day of tremendous sadness. 24,000 great sages died. All that Torah, all those students of Rabbi Kiva died, but five students remained. And these five students, essentially, they were the vital links connecting the Torah that Rabbi Kiva studied from his predecessors to the next generation. And thus, the fact that these five students survived and they didn't die, and they, and, and, and Lag Barmer was the day where they stopped dying, and these five students survived, if not for that, we wouldn't have Torah. We wouldn't exist. Because the Jewish nation was hanging on a thread. It was hanging on a thread, and that thread was these five students, and this is the day, Lot Bomer, when they were preserved, and our nation lived to survive another day. And in fact, the Talmud tells us, who are these five students? Who's Rabbi Meir? Well, Rabbi Meir is a student of Rabbi Kiva, we know that. But what's his role in history? Says the Talmud. In the book of Sanhedrin, page 86a, if you have a Mishnah, again, a Mishnah is the book of oral Torah of Jewish law, and the Mishnah just teaches the law, it's unattributed. Who's the author? The author is Rabbi Meir. In effect, the Mishnah is the notes of Rabbi Meir. And then what about the other students of Rabbi Tiva? Well, if you have a Sifra, which is another accompanying book, that's written by Rabbi Yehuda. If you have a Sifri, it's Rabbi Shimon. These are all the students of Rabbi Akiva who are perpetuating Torah and authoring the authoritative books of oral Torah to the next generation. And their survival was somehow unlocked during Lag Omer, during the 33rd day of, of the Omer. Now, one of his students, one of these five students, most symbolizes Lag Bomer above all of them, and that is Rabbi Shimon, known full, by his full name as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the son of Yochai. His, father, his father's name was Yochai. And in fact, the day that he passed, his yard site is on the 33rd day of the Omer. Now, Rabbi Shimon is a very pivotal character in Jewish history. He is someone who is uh, traditionally accepted as the author of the Zohar, which is the authoritative kind of oral Torah companion, just like there's the Mishnah in the revealed Torah. There's the Zohar in the hidden Torah, in the Kabbalah. And he's someone who actually is able to play in both fields because the fourth most common name in Mishnah is Rabbi Shimon one of the great students of Rabbi Tiva. He's teaching us revealed Torah. And he's the author of the Zohar of the hidden Torah. So he's one of these great titans that is transmitting Torah to the next generation. And his the day of his passing is the 33rd day of the Omer. Moreover, when you open up the Zohar, you find out some tremendous, miraculous, wondrous things that happened on the original 33rd day of the Omer, the day of his passing, there is a section in the Zohar called the Idra Zuta. And that is the teachings of Rabbi Shimon and the stories that happened to him on the Lag Omer of his passing. And it tells us that he was revealing secrets of the Torah to his students on that day. And the sun did not set until he had finished revealing the, sec- the secrets of the hidden Torah till his students. And then he declares, this day, the day of the third day of the Omer, is my day. It's the day of Rabbi Shimon. 
and it's always going to be associated with me. And it's a day that my priorities, it's a day that my ideals are going to be tremendously powerful. And thus, a lot of the themes of what people do in Lag Bomer and a lot of the ways to unlock the power of Lag Bomer is very much linked to this statement that we have, that this is the day of Rabbi Shimon, and this is the day where his Torah and his insights and his character really wield their most influence. So one of the traditions is to study the teachings of Rabbi Shimon on this day and to try to identify with the themes of Rabbi Shimon and of, of his teachings, connect to him, connect to his Torah, and use that to unlock the powers of the day. So I wanted to go through some of the teachings of Rabbi Shimon that really are his hallmarks. And some of them are very dramatic stories. Some of them are very difficult concepts, not necessarily intellectually difficult, but difficult to to absorb. But it's worthwhile to kind of keep these things in mind on Lager Moment as we prepare for it. So, for example, one of the themes that we see in our sages' uh, teachings in his name, in the stories that we find out about him in the Talmud, is the idea of total dedication to Torah. 100%. Not 99.9, 100%. And if you think about it, you know, Rabbi Shimon emerges in a time where 24,000 students are dead. There's five students remaining. Think about it. We live in a world, thank God, where there's many, many rabbis and scholars, and there's a lot of Torah. There's a renaissance of Torah that exists right now. In the times of the end of Rabbi Kiva's life, there was this event, this cataclysmic event, where thousands, 24,000 students, almost the entire ranks of all the sages, all the young sages, the next generation, they all die. And what do you have? You have five students. And what's the attitude of these students? We see with Rabbi Shimon, he realizes it's the time now to rebuild. There's a famous statement that is quoted in his name, the Talmud, where he said, God forbid the Jewish people forgot the Torah. God forbid. All of humanity, everything hinges on this. The whole world, for certainly the nation, hinges on the Jewish people maintaining their connection to Torah. God forbid they forget it. And therefore, what stance does he take? He takes a stance of total commitment to Torah, total, total immersion in Torah, and not a single inch of compromise. So for example, the Talmud of Book of Brachos, page 35b, has a following dilemma. You know, we know we have to study Torah. We're Jews after all. On the other hand, you may have a family and you have mouths to feed. So you have to have a livelihood. What do you do? How do you balance those priorities? So it brings an opinion of Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Shmuel says, listen, of course, Torah is your priority. But your family is also a priority. It's also a value. So you have to figure out when it's time to work in the field, when it's time to work in your job. You got to work. Other times you got to study Torah. You have to try to find a way to harmonize your dual responsibilities, your responsibility to Torah and your responsibility to your family for your livelihood. That's what Rabbi Shmuel says. A very pragmatic approach. Comes along Rabbi Shimon. And he says like this, I don't, I don't get it. When it's time to plow, you're going to plow. When it's time to sow, you're going to sow. When it's time to harvest, you're going to, you're going to harvest. When it's time to gather, you're going to gather. Your whole life, you're going to be busy. When are you going to study Torah? And he's like, no, th- that's not the solution. I'll tell you what the solution is. You know what the solution is? Study Torah all the time, day and night, and never depart from it. What's going to be with your family? What's going to be with your children? How are you going to make a livelihood? Rely on God. Just rely on God. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. That's it. When the Jewish people are doing the will of God, says Rabbi Shimon, don't worry about it. He's got you covered. The Almighty loves you like a child. You study Torah. He's got you covered. Only Torah and reliance on God. You know, the Talmud goes on to say, well, a lot of people tried this. It wasn't so successful for them. People said, you know what? I'm not going to feed my family. I'm just going to rely on God. And they stayed hungry because they weren't able to hack it. But certainly his characteristic is one of total reliance on God. Now, parenthetically, our sages tell us that the manna, when did the manna start falling? So it's sometime between the Exodus and Shavuos, because they were eating matzah as they were leaving Egypt, the time that they were hurrying up and baking the matzah, so they had some matzah, but when the matzah ran out, the manna came. When did the manna come? 
I say this talith on the 33rd day of the Omer. Well, what's the manna? The manna is God saying, I will provide food for you. You do your job and I got you covered. You don't need to work. You don't need to plow. You don't need to plant. You don't need to till. You don't need to harvest. None of that. God got you covered. And that is the day. When did this start? On Rabbi Shimon's day. And that's his characteristic that he most embodies. Rely on God. Study Torah. And don't worry about it. Now, the same uncompromising characteristic is exhibited in another famous event of his life. There was a discussion amongst the sages. You have Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Hudo. These are three of the five students of Rabbi Tiva who survived. And there's some other individual, a son of a convert, and he's also listening in the conversation. And this story is told in the Talmud, page 33b of the book of Shabbos. And they start talking about the Romans. Remember, this is the time that all the troubles of the Jewish people are primarily the products of, of Roman oppression. So they start having a conversation, the rabbis, amongst themselves about the Romans. Are they good or are they bad? So Rabbi Yehuda, he begins and says, listen, you know, the Romans, yes, they're barbarians and yes, they're very cruel. But after all, look, look, look what they did. They established marketplaces and they built bridges and they built bathhouses, there's something very redeeming, very admirable about them. That's what Rabbi Yudah says. Rabbi Yossi is quiet. He doesn't participate. Rabbi Shimon, he's not compromising. He's not willing to whitewash or color his perspective. He doesn't say the truth exactly the way it is. So what does he say? He says, everything they did, they did only for themselves. It was selfish. Why did they build marketplaces? Because they wanted to have brothels. Why did they establish bathhouses? Because they wanted to beautify themselves. Why did they build bridges? Because they wanted to collect tolls. Everything was selfish. There was These people are not worthy of any admiration. In any event, the individual that was there, the son of the converts, he overhears this conversation. And he quickly runs to go tell the authorities. These rabbis have some interesting opinions about their Roman overlords. So the Romans find out what happened, and they find out that Rabbi Yehuda, he praised them. Rabbi Yehuda, you're going to be promoted. We're going to make sure that whenever you – there's a lecture in the, in, the, in, in the study house, you're going to be one that's going to give the lecture. Rabbi Yossi, you were quiet. You were ambiguous. You're going to have to be exiled. You have to move to a different city. Rabbi Shimon, you were the one who spoke negatively about the Romans. You're going to be executed. You're a wanted man. So what does Rabbi Shimon do? He escapes and eventually he's worried that his location is going to be divulged to the Romans and he finds a second location to hide in a barren cave where he's hiding together with his son. And the Talmud tells us that they're there for 12 years. They only have one set of clothing. It must have left in a hurry and they don't want the clothing to get damaged. So they take off their clothing and they submerge themselves up to their necks in sand. And they're studying Torah the whole week. How do they survive? They survive a miraculous tree, a carob tree sprouts out outside the cave, outside the cave. A trickling stream of water provides them water. And they study Torah in the sand the whole week. And on Shabbos, they put on the clothing in honor of Shabbos. And he's someone clearly is living by his ideals. 100% Torah, 100% no compromise. Well, what's going to be? How are you going to feed yourself? Don't worry about it. If you're really 100% dedicated, God will get you covered. So they're there for 12 years. Eventually, they leave after 12 years, and they're having a very hard time acclimating with society. They walk around. They see people are involved with other pursuits. They're not studying Torah. And eventually... A prophetic voice announces to them, time to go back to the cave. You guys are not, you guys are going to destroy the world. You're not ready for society, reintegration with society. Go back to the cave. They go back to the cave. They spend another year there and eventually come out and they are happy to see that the people are not totally obsessed with just the material world. And Rabbi Shimon begins his process of building his student body of teaching Torah to the next generation. Now, one of the themes that we see with Rabbi Shimon 
is the fact that he was a man of miracles. So he comes out of the cave and he makes a pronouncement. He says, listen, Jacob, when a miracle happened to Jacob, Jacob did something for the benefit of the public. And therefore, because a miracle happened to me, I'm going to do something for the benefit of the public. What does the public need? And they tell him, there's a problem in the city of Tiberias. In this city, the Kohanim, the priests, don't know where corpses are buried. If you're a Kohen, you can't walk around the place where there is a grave. Corpses are buried there. And therefore, because the grave, the graves, the places where people buried were not marked, they couldn't walk anywhere really. And therefore, if you could solve this problem, you could identify exactly where the dead people are buried, that would be a huge boon for the community. So he's like, okay, challenge accepted. He investigates in the following manner. Is there anyone here that knows about any place that definitely is pure? And he speaks, there's an old man, and he tells him a story. Eventually, he finds out where the places are pure. He starts from there, and he does this process of walking around. And the Talmud tells us that he's able to identify which place has a body buried, and which place does not have a body buried. In fact, Rashi even understands that the bo- that the bodies began to float, the corpses began to float to the top where you could mark out where the body is and know that the Kohen would avoid it. And some people start laughing at him. They're like this whole place was a cemetery and comes along Rabbi Shimon and he's able to cleanse, to purify a cemetery. And they start ma- making fun of the whole thing. And those people, they right away, they just drop dead. It's like a different level of, of, of a persona, of a stature, where the normal rules of humanity just don't apply to him. There's another story told uh, about Rabbi Shimon in the Midrash. One of the students of Rabbi Shimon, he went to uh, the diaspora, leaves Israel, and goes into business and is very successful and comes back and has got lots of money. And all these students that stayed studying Torah, they look at him and they're all envious. So Rabbi Shimon takes this whole student body. They go out and they go to the city of Meiru where they're, where they're located and they go to the valley. And he starts praying and he says, okay, I want this valley to fill up with gold coins. And right away, the whole valley fills up with gold coins. And he tells the students, okay, you're jealous of this guy? You want gold? Go take it. Go take it. It's yours. But you should know that whatever you're taking right now, you're going to lose from your portion in Olam Haba because you're going to, you're going to exhaust your reward over here. And obviously, the people took the lesson home that what really matters, you know, after you die, your money doesn't have any value to you. It's just your Torah, it's just your mitzvahs that you've done, just your good deeds, your acts of kindness, your prayer. Those are the things that accompany you, not your money. And therefore, why would you waste your time here focusing only on the temporary while ignoring the permanent? Now, together with the concept of him doing these miracles is Rabbi Shimon annulling decrees. So, for example, there's a few stories of this in the Talmud and in the Zohar. In the Zohar, we read that Rabbi Shimon arrived at a certain city and there were dead people as a result of a plague. And Rabbi Shimon says, I don't get it. If I'm in the city, how could there be a plague? And he declares, I want this plague to be over. And indeed, the plague stopped. And the onlookers said, this is unbelievable. When there was a plague in the book of Numbers, Moses has to stand between the living and the dead to stop them. Whereas Rabbi Shimon, it seems like his power of annulling decrees is even greater than Moses. He does it only with his words. And one of the major themes of Lag Bomer, again, the day of Rabbi Shimon, is the power of this day to annul decrees. We all know that the future is very much uncertain. And even the present, you know, some people have 
illnesses, God forbid. Some people have predicaments in their lives. Everyone's got challenges. And we believe that those are decrees from God. Those are decrees from heaven. But those decrees are subject to being changed. Who was more powerful at changing those decrees than Rabbi Shimon? Almost nobody. And therefore, on this day, where his power, where his, where his personality, where his character and his stature and his persona are most palpable and most efficacious, this is the day to annul those decrees. There's another story in the Talmud. This is from the book of Me'ila, page 17a into 17b. The Talmud tells us, again, the Romans, they are misbehaving, and they made a three-pronged decree against the Jewish people. Number one, that they cannot observe the Shabbat. Number two, that they cannot circumcise their boys. And number three, that they cannot obey the laws of of ritual purity vis-a-vis marital relations. So the laws of family purity, they couldn't, they couldn't obey, they couldn't observe. So how do we solve this problem? The Romans are attacking some of the very foundational cores of the Jewish people. So one of the rabbis, his name was Rabbi Ruvain, he had a solution. He disguised himself as a Gentile. And the Talmud explains what did he do. He cut his hair in the front and let his hair in the back grow like a mullet. That was the hairstyle that was popular amongst the Romans. And he went and he infiltrated the Roman inner circle. And he started lobbying them. He says, listen, if you have an enemy, do you want to be rich or do you want to be poor? And they say, well, if we have an enemy, we want them to be to be poor. Well, the Jewish people, you're, they're your enemy, right? So why would you force them to work on Shabbat? If they want to take a day off of work, let them take a day off of work. They'll be poorer. They're like, well, that's, that, that makes sense. Okay, they got rid of that decree. And then the Rabbi Ruvain, again, dressed up, masquerading as a as a Roman, he tells them, if you have an enemy, do you want it to be weak? Or do you want it to be strong? Well, of course, we have an enemy. We want it to be, to be weak. Well, okay, let them circumcise their boys. Let them weaken themselves. Brilliant. Okay, we're annulling that degree too. And then he says, well, if you have an enemy, do you want it to be numerous or do you want it to be few? We want it to be few. So tell them that they want to stop cohabiting with their wives for two weeks every month. Well, then they'll be less fertile. So therefore, you should allow them to obey the laws of family purity. Brilliant. They accepted his advice and they annulled that decree too. Problem solved, right? Wrong. Eventually, the Romans discovered the ruse. They realized that he's Jewish and he just got dressed up. He just got that Roman haircut and he did that just to lobby them in the favor of the Jews. So right away, they restored all these edicts. Now, the Jewish people have a dilemma. What to do? How do we once again annul these decrees? And everyone agreed there's only one man for the job. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So he heads out to Rome. He travels from from Israel, from northern Israel, and he's going to go do it. He's going to go solve the problem. He's going to walk into the lion's den. He's going to lobby them. Along the way, says the Talmud, a demon joined his entourage. I want to help you. Is it okay if I help you, says the demon to Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon says, yes. But then he starts crying. He says, Hagar, the maidservant of Abraham, three times she had angels appear to her. And all I get is this lousy demon to help me. How far we have fallen. Regardless what happens, the demon runs up into Rome, goes to the Caesar's daughter, and embeds himself in the Caesar's daughter. And she's going crazy. She's going nuts. She's Screaming at the top of her lungs, I need Rabbi Shimon, I need Rabbi Shimon. Again, this is caused by the demon. This is a story in the Talmud. This is not, uh, it's not, it's not from the Midrash, it's from the Zohar, this is from the Talmud. And the whole city is in an uproar 
where is this Rabbi Shimon? We need someone to solve this problem. So he walks into the city and everyone's looking high and low for Rabbi Shimon. He's like, well, here I am. Quickly they usher him into the inner sanctums of uh, of the palace and he meets the girl. And he speaks to the demon and says, okay, demon, you've done your job. Come out. And he comes out. And miraculously, the girl stops wailing. She's been healed. They're so thankful. They thank you profusely. Whatever you want, you get. Whatever you want. They bring him to the storage houses of gold. Anything. Anything you want. It's all yours. Of course, he has no interest in that. He just starts looking through the decrees. And he finds the decree that says Jewish people can't do these three things, can't obey these three mitzvahs. This is all I want. That's all you want. Take it happily. He rips it up and he heads back to Israel. So this story, incidentally, it's a, it's a, um, an example, a testament to the power of annulling decrees of Rabbi Shimon and consequently the power that we have on this day, Rabbi Shimon's day to annul the decrees, number one. But it's also been suggested that there's an ancient custom to give haircuts on the 33rd day of, of the Omer especially for young children. We know that there's a custom to not give young boys haircuts until they're three years old. And it's a widespread, ubiquitous custom to bring the kids to Meiron, to the burial spot of Rabbi Shimon, to give them the first haircut on the 33rd day of the Omer. Where does that come from? What's the origin of that custom? It's been suggested that Rabbi Shimon is the one who was able to save the Jewish people with a Jewish haircut. The other rabbi, Rabbi Ruvain, had to put the mullet on, had to get the non-Jewish haircut to try to save the Jewish people. It didn't work. And what does Rabbi Shimon do? He doesn't change anything. He kind of maintains the Jewish look, the Jewish look, the Jewish hairstyle, and he's able to save the Jews nonetheless. And therefore, on this day that we are, again, trying to tap into the experience of Rabbi Shimon, we give our kids a Jewish haircut, the first Jewish haircut on the 30th day, day of Omer on the Rabbi Shimon's day in Meiron to kind of tap into this power. There was a story with the Arizal. The Arizal, of course, was the titan of, of Kabbalah in the 16th century. And he actually lived in Sfat, not far from Meiron. And of course, they would go every year to Meiron, to, which is again the place where Rabbi Shimon is buried. And the story is told that one year, the Arizal was dancing with his students on Lag Bomer in Meiron, and a tall, elderly individual that no one knew was there. And they danced with the Arizal and all the students, and afterwards, the Arizal tells his students, by the way, that man that no one recognized, you know who he really is? He really is Rabbi Shimon. He came here to join with us. And that's one of the themes that we see. It's a little bit advanced for us because we're simple people. But in all the Kabbalistic sources, they talk about the Rabbi Shimon himself actually comes on this day. It's his day, and whoever comes to his gravesites to connect to him, he's kind of there as well. And it's a day to really unlock a lot of 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 the power inherent in Rabbi Shimon's own life, and to make great advances on this day, both spiritually and even materially. Another one of the customs of this day is the custom of burning bonfires. I remember as a kid, every year, now, now it's like you have to deal with the fire code and and you have to do it uh, with a permit. But uh, as a child, when I was uh, seven and eight years old, my parents lived in Jerusalem. So for a brief period, I was living in Jerusalem. And the day after Pesach, all the kids in the whole country, they start building their massive bonfires. Some of them put an effigy of Haman on top of it. It gets uh, pretty dramatic because they get they build them pretty big. So like they're chopping down trees and all the cardboard in the whole country is utilized for these for these fires. They put in the potatoes, of course. They wrap the potatoes in silver foil and put it under there. It's a it's a big deal. It's essentially the pastime of Israeli kids and probably some Americans as, as well from the day after Pesach until Lag Baomer. And I remember the fires are, are so big and so vast. I remember like being, you know, 30, 40 feet away and you could just feel that intense heat. 
But what's the connection between Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, between Lad Bomer, to all the stories that we've seen about him and the custom in America, they light candles, but they also have a custom to do the bonfires and barbecues, things like that. Where does that originate? So it's been suggested, like the Zohar tells us, that on the day that Rabbi Shimon passed away on Lag Ba Omer, the original Lag Ba Omer, so to speak, the sun didn't set until he was done. And, you know, if we're familiar with, with Jewish literature, the concept of the sun not setting or setting prematurely, so to speak, it's a very lofty status, you know, for, for Joshua and, and Jacob and the like. And the fact that the Zohar tells us that this, this applies also to Rabbi Shimon is, is quite noteworthy. But if the sun, so to speak, the beacon of light didn't set on this day, it became a tradition that on the night of Lad Bomer, we too transform the night into day via this barbecue, via this candle, via this bonfire to again try to re-experience the Rabbi Shimon experience. So that's the day. It's a day that punctuates a time of mourning. We have the mourning for the students of, of Rabbi, Sh- of Rabbi Ativa. We try to learn the lesson about them. You know, they didn't accord honor to Torah. They didn't accord honor to each other. We want to make sure that we have our Dutch in order on that plane. Make sure that we are doing our due diligence to prepare for Sinai, to prepare for the receiving of the Torah on Shavuot. So on one hand, there's the sadness that is part and parcel of this time. Of course, the general theme of the County of the Omer, preparing for, for Sinai and preparing for Torah and trying to kind of ascend those runs, those 50 runs, and to try to reach the peak of, of the Seder night, of the first night of, of, of Pesach, to try to reach it step by step. There's, of course, in the... In the Perky Avos, in the last chapter, there's the 48 ways to wisdom. The Mishnah tells us that there's 48 ways to acquire wisdom. And that, of course, corresponds to the 49 days. So there's a big question. Is the 48 plus one? Is it one day of review? Is it one day of preparation? But it's a widespread custom to say, okay, there's 48 stages, so to speak, of preparation. Each one of those days corresponds to, to one. And in addition, it's also a day of – the Lagba Omer specifically is a day of, of, of happiness. It's a day of happiness, A, in the fact that our nation still survives. Why did it survive? Because of this day. This is a day where those five students, yes, co- comparing five students that survived to 24 that didn't, it seems to be asymmetrical. But when you look at history, those five students gave us the Judaism that we have today. They were the ones who transmitted Rabbi Kiva's Torah – who codified the Jewish Torah to the next generation eventually and proliferated the ranks of uh, of the students. And specifically, we hone in on Rabbi Shimon, on, on his personal life, his characteristics, and try to tap into some of the magic, so to speak, of Rabbi Shimon and to, to glean insights from him. There's a famous song that is sung called Bar Yochai. On this, uh, on this day. And, you know, why are we singing a song about Rabbi Shimon and we're calling it Barichai, the son of Yochai? Doesn't it make sense to talk about Rabbi Shimon himself? And the answer is perhaps that Rabbi Shimon himself, we read these stories and we've only shared a few of them. There's, there's some other wild, wild stories that we've, that we've skipped. And if you've thought some of these stories that we did share sound too fantastic, Yes, they're miraculous, but there's more where that came from and maybe some of them even more dramatic. And if we try to connect to Rabbi Shimon and his Torah, it's beyond us. But we have to remember, he's Bar Yochai, he's the son of Yochai. He's a human like us. He had his challenges like we do. And therefore, we focus on that. He's, you know, his father was Yochai. Our father is our whoever it is. And not to say, oh, because I cannot, I have no con- conceptualization of this angelic figure. I shouldn't try to connect to him and his Torah at all. No, to the contrary. Bar Yochai, he was a son of a father, just like you're the son of the father. 
there's something that you could study with him as well. There is, again, the concept of dedication to Torah, of restoration of Torah to its prominence. Torah was decimated, and Rabbi Shimon is one of the characters who is restoring it, the episodes of his prayer, of his kindness, and of course, tapping into the power of Rabbi Shimon Baruch to remove all the harmful decrees that we may have on our ledger. I, I read today maybe like 30 stories of people who had miraculous things happen to them in Meron when they went to visit Rabbi Shimon on this day, but even outside of Meron when they tap into his power. One of them I read, it was dated to the year 1923 in Meron with eyewitnesses who experienced this. The story was told that there was a couple that was childless and they went to Meron to pray on Lot Bomer to have a child. And indeed, they had a child. Miracle, right? Okay. And they promised, so to speak, when they prayed that if the Almighty blesses us with a child, it's important to note, whenever you're praying at the gravesite of of the righteous, you're not praying to the dead person, to the deceased, even as righteous as as they may be, but you're praying to God on behalf of the merit of that person. So the Almighty granted them a child. A child was born. They promised they're going to bring the child back, give them the haircut in Meron. Baby's born. Three years later, they come back to Meron to give the child a haircut. And something happened. It's not clear what happened, but the child died on that day. Child was dead. And obviously, everyone's devastated. What a tragedy. And the child's mother starts wailing and starts praying. And she takes her deceased young boy and she puts him on the uh, on the gravesite, so to speak. She closes the room and they start everyone starts praying. Save us from this. Re- revive this child, resuscitate this child in the marriage of Rabbi Shimon. And their prayer was efficacious. And they hear from the other side of the door, kid wakes up and he's thirsty. He's been healed. This happened, again, in modern times and has been told over by witness, eyewitnesses who experienced it. It's documented. And of course, for us, this is a lot of these concepts are, are very hard to, to understand, to process. But that's certainly the impression we get of Rabbi Shimon, even if we discount the Zohar, we discount the Kabbalah, just what's in the Talmud about him. He's described as someone who is melumad benisim. He's trained in miracles. This is a day for us to also maybe tap into the power with our prayer, with our connect- connection to Rabbi Shimon and his Torah and his teachings to hopefully garner some miracles of our own.